Amen. All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Fannin, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. And i um, looking forward to preaching, and hopefully I don't screw it up too bad. So if I do, just have patience with me in my folly. But um, today is a very significant day with me. It is not only Wednesday, but it's March the 15th, the Ides of March. If you're Julius Caesar scholars are in here, you know that the Ides of March, March the 15th, was the day he was betrayed and stabbed by his uh, uh, conspirators, his generals, and, and Bruto and all those guys, or Bruno, or whatever. Um, but yeah, um, the Ides of March. But not only, that, that's not significant for me. I was not a, a part of that conspiracy. Um, I joined the, uh, the, the military on March the 15th in 2002. So that was 21 years ago today. Um, so last week I celebrated my wedding anniversary. Tonight, today I'm celebrating my army anniversary. So it's pretty cool. Um, the title of my sermon tonight is Life is Hard Enough Without Money Problems. Life is hard enough without money problems. All right. Uh, is it just me, or I'm speaking to the adults in the room, but do you ever look around at your kids playing, having a good time, not a care in the world, young and carefree, just running around, having a good time, and you're like, man, I wish I could be like them again, just have no responsibilities, and sometimes I just wish I was that, you know, blonde-headed boy playing in the backyard, playing baseball in the summertime with all my friends, and you know, not a care in the world. It's just an endless day. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, but don't get me wrong. I, I definitely love being a father and a husband. And uh, that's one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. But, um, and I'm also very happy for this church and having our kids growing up with your kids and getting to watch the same joy that I had as a kid growing up with my friends and knowing that they're not deprived of such. I'm thankful that I didn't grow up in this time, in this day and age. You know, I was able to leave my house in the mornings, get on my bike, and just roam the neighborhood. And we'd catch up a ball game in this person's backyard and on the other side of the neighborhood being playing basketball in another friend's yard. And I wouldn't let my, friend, my kids get on a bicycle and just tear out. That's not going to happen, not in 2023. So I'm glad we have a, a space for them to come to with good kids to play with that I know that are faithful and they love God and they're being raised up the same way I'm trying to raise my kids. So we're mighty blessed to be in this situation. But anyways, tonight I want to talk about money and in particular, avoiding money problems. So life is hard, uh, or at least I seem to think it is. And uh, it's, it's something that when I look back on my life, I, I can look at specific areas and times in my life where things have been more of a struggle than they are. And it always seems like when you're going through something, it's super, super hard. And then you come out on the other side and you look back at it and you're, that wasn't so bad after all. Like in, uh, in my childhood when I began middle school, when I stepped up from the elementary age into the middle school age and school got really tough all of a sudden. I was like, man, I thought school was just about PE and going outside and playing recess and they cut out all that stuff and now it's math and, and grammar got a lot tougher and everything's going on. Uh, but then I graduated out of the middle school and I went into the high school and middle school wasn't that tough anymore. And the high school was tough and stressful. And you had to figure out your life in that time. You had to say, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to be? Where am I going to go? What am I going to, what's going to happen? And uh, so Luke just finished up high school and he's getting uh, to move into the next stage of life. And that's a good one. That's a very good stage. After high school with me, I went into basic training. I was at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and I left and I was there throughout the whole winter time. I started in October of 2002 and I graduated February 14th Valentine's Day on uh, 2003 and that was a tough tough winter. It was freezing cold. I was away from home for the first time. You know it was it was really tough and looking back on my high school days I was like yeah high school was a joke. 
This whole uh, army stuff, that's the hard challenge right there. And so I got out of the army, or I got out of basic training. I'm still in the army. I'm getting out of that next month. But um, I got out of basic training. I got to come back home because I was in the National Guard and the reserve status. And I started college. Now that was really easy, actually. <laughs> college was sort of a joke, in my opinion, after coming off of basic training and AIT school and all that. I was like, man, I got so much free time on my hands. I'm used to waking up at 4 a.m. and going all day long until I crash at 10 o'clock at night. And, and it's just nonstop, no days off. And college was kind of a walk in the park. And then uh, Iraq happened. And that was the real hard challenge. And my wife and I, we were just starting out in our relationship. And um, I went off and I was gone for 18 months. And I was away from home again, away from my uh, very, very serious girlfriend, but not yet fiance. And, um, you know, I, I got blown up three times while I was there. I lost three good friends while I was there. That was the challenge. And um, then I came home from that, got married. And then just having to step up as a provider. That's a burden. That's a challenge. Um, and, you know, the first five years of our marriage, we didn't have any kids. We thought something was wrong. I was telling the kids about it this morning, actually, in our morning Bible study. We were having a little chat about it. And I was like, you know, we, we thought we were going to have to adopt kids. And thankfully, the Lord sent you guys on along. And you just haven't stopped coming yet. So, you know, we've been blessed. But stepping into that new role as a husband and a provider and a, and a father. And I started a lawn care business. And, and that was hard work. And then I, I became a recruiter, and learning that career was a hard challenge. And then I, uh, I decided I was going to go crazy and lose my mind and get a real estate license. That didn't get him looking up. Oh, there we go. All right. And I, that was really hard, Brother Luke. So, and uh, in the first, the first year, my wife and I, we both had our real estate license, and I think we sold one property the whole 12 months. That's not what you wanted to hear, right? Don't quit your day job. Um, but after years of that, we decided, you know, after we saw more success and we started, we opened up our own company, um, our own firm. And that was a whole new level of stress, opening and running your own real estate practice, your own firm and hiring agents and, and, and trying to just be the face of your business out there in the community. That was a challenge. And... Um, Anyways, I say all that to say this, life is hard and it hasn't, it hasn't got easy for me yet. And you know what? I don't really think that's God's plan for Christians to just check out and say, hey, it's all downhill from here. You know, we, we reached the top. It's all gravy train. That, that's not God's plan for us. He's put us here to work and to labor and, and that's us. So... Anyways, when I was describing all that to you, who could feel their blood pressure start to rise a little bit? You know, your breath starts to get a little shorter and, and you're not so relaxed anymore. Well, that's how I meant it to come across. And if it doesn't, didn't do that, then maybe you are on a, a gravy train. I don't know. Um, but anyways, I get uncomfortable thinking about the, uh, the, the stressors of life. And, but, but the biggest stressor of all... The person I wouldn't want to trade places with is my wife. She's got a hard, hard job. Just like all of your men's wives, that is uh, one job I would never want to sign up for, just the daily task of being a mom. She is, I mean, from the time she opens her eyes until she goes and lays down, she's just on. And during the middle of the night, don't forget about that. She's just up and down, up and down. She lets me just snore all night long, and that's, that's wonderful. That's a beautiful thing. Um, I will gladly do my job of providing and driving us around and mowing the lawn and taking out the trash and helping out where I can, doing honeydew projects, and that's, that's easy uh, compared to what she does. So, But anyways, as I look back on my life and I see that I'm in a, a constant state of stress, I wouldn't... I would call it a constant state of stress, but I'm not stressed out. There's a difference. You shouldn't be stressed out. You're under pressure, 
but you can stand firm if, uh, if you keep your priorities in line. Um, anyway, so there's all these stresses from being a provider and running businesses and uh, you know, being a good husband and all that stuff. But I, I look forward to the day, as the, the, the hymn writer wrote, and one of our favorite hymns we like to sing, I look forward to the day I want to be a soul winner till Jesus calls for me to lay my burdens down. I look forward to that day. Not only do I get to see Christ, not only do I get to be reunited with family members and friends, and I just have nothing but pleasant things to look forward to for all eternity, I get to leave behind all the stress and all the burdens I've carried my whole life. Now, I'm well aware that our work is not finished. Even in eternity, we're still going to be working for God. But that's just going to be a pleasant opportunity every day to get to go to work for God. I mean, that's super cool. We're, we're not going to have hunger. We're not going to have, uh, we're not going to be growing weary. We're, we're just going to be constantly at an all-time high that never fades. It's going to be wonderful. The work is going to be enjoyable. It's going to be just perfect. So I'm looking forward to that. But that, I'm not there yet. And neither are y'all. And you little ones, you'll get there one day. And, and until the day they call us, until the day Christ calls us home, we're going to be under that pressure of life. And that's how God wants it to be. By the sweat of thy brow shalt thou labor six days. So... Uh, but you're constantly going to be stretched and tested and proven, and, and that's just what you have to, to keep in mind. But we still have, uh, we still got to raise these kids up and, and train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, we, we still have to provide for these kids and be good husbands, and, and, and wives have to be good wives, and we still have uh, soul winning presentations to give, a lot of doors left to knock. We still have a lot of sermons to preach, and uh, we have a lot of charity to bestow upon our neighbors and our enemies. So, as our older brother Paul wrote in Galatians 6, 9, Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So I know you're tired and you have stress and I know you have fears and doubts, but my brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, count it all joy. Right, kids? When you suffer great tribulations. Anyways, it's one of my kids' songs. They like to sing it around the house. I know y'all know that, too. But uh, that's James chapter 1, 2, and 3. Um, but the other day, the last time we were at church, before we took our little vacation trip, Brother Luke was preaching. And he was preaching about uh, David. And he went back into uh, 1 Samuel 17, and he was talking about um, David. He was being prepared to fight Goliath. And before he fought Goliath, he squared off with a lion and a bear. And, you know, I'm sure David did not sign up for those two fights. He was out there minding his own business with his sheep in the tall green grass beside the still waters, listening to the wind rustling through the trees, and here comes a lion stalking up, slowly moving towards his flock. It didn't catch David by surprise. He saw the lion coming. He grabbed his staff and he stood to his feet and he says, if this lion doesn't turn to the right hand or the left hand, it's going to be me and him because I'm not backing down. And that's exactly what happened. He smote that lion. He grabbed him by the beard and he smote the lion. And that lion was sent there by God. Because he had to prepare him for the next battle that was soon to come right upon his heels, the bear. Now these are two ferocious animals that would destroy a man easily. You know, a, a lion and a bear, two of the greatest predators on this earth. And if you're all you're fighting them off with is a staff in the hands of a boy, that's a tough, tough situation. But that lion and that bear were sent to him from God. So it would prepare him, as Brother Luke pointed out to us, it would prepare him to stand off and square off against Goliath, the even bigger challenge. 
And so, um, after Goliath, we all know that story, one of the most famous stories in the Bible, he was able to stand and fight the, the armies of the Philistines. All of those battles prior, the, the lion, the bear, and the, the giant prepared him to lead the armies of Israel. And, and that, that in turn prepared him for that. And then it turned into the persecution from King Saul. And you don't realize it, but uh, David spent probably more than 20 years on the run from King Saul, living in caves. And most of the Psalms were written during this time where his friends didn't want to have anything to do with him. And they looked the other way and, and he was just, you know, an outcast. And, and you got to be a pretty strong man to, when an entire nation is trying to hunt you down to kill you. And, and all that, God sent all that to prove David. And, all, and in all those things, the Bible says that David behaved himself wisely, right? And then we see, after David becomes king, we see David fall into sin with Bathsheba, and he commits adultery and, and later murder. And then we see the fallout, the consequences. His infant son passes away in a week. Uh, his son Amnon commits a despicable crime and sin and against his own sister Tamar. He dies for it. Absalom, his own other son, turns against him and, and, and steals the kingdom from his father and puts him into flight. And, and all of this also came from the Lord. But David brought that upon himself. So I want to tell you that if, if you're doing the best you can and you're, you're not living in sin, and you're, you're trying to be a faithful church member, and a good soul winner, and a good provider, and a good husband, and you're still facing these terrible trials and, and tribulations, it's probably from the Lord. And, and it, it's probably not your own fault. You're probably behaving yourself wisely, but God is testing you. He's stretching you. He's proving you so you can stand up to, to bigger and better battles in the future. He wants you to accomplish more, and he can't use you in your current state. He can use you after you come out of this current trial. You're going to be stronger mentally, physically, spiritually, and able to accomplish what he has in store for you next. So I believe if David had never faced off with that lion, he would not have ever become the king of Israel and seen all those great things. All right, um, so that reminds me of our current tr situations and trials. I, I think about Miss Grant, I think it's been five or six years she's been dealing with this brain tumor. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a trial. And I'm sure they have been well ready. The Grant family is more than ready, and we're all more than ready for them to come out the other end of this trial. Um, think about the Andrews family. I can't imagine what it's like to step inside the shoes of Chris Andrews. Not only does he have all the, the, the stressors that I previously related to you as, as being a father and a husband, but he's taking on the role of the mother and caring for the mother herself. That's a lot of work on his shoulders. I, I don't know exactly how long this trial is going to last, but when they come out on the other side, and they will, they are going to be primed to turn the world upside down. I believe that. They are going to do such great things for God. They're going to have such a powerful testimony. They're probably just going to tell the kids, get in the van. We're going across the country. We've got a story to tell. And, you know, they're just going to just start revivals everywhere they go. They're just going to be on fire for the Lord. And with that renewed energy. And, and Miss Cheryl, you know, she's going to be... Uh, a great testimony one day. I know that God, God is using them. So anyways, say all that to say this again. Life is hard. Uh, it's nice and pleasant when you're young and carefree. You know, we got Titus in here and my daughter Katie and we got Landon in the bag. I see Lawson and, and we got these kids that are just enjoying their life. But when they grow up, they're going to learn responsibilities and as Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 1.14, he says, I have seen the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. 
Am I encouraging you guys yet? <laughs> I want to encourage you, but first I got to give you the sobering news. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. So knowing that life is hard, and I look back on my life and I see the constant state of stress and progression and of said hardness, I cannot help to wonder what the Lord is preparing me for and what's going to be next in my life. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles, but I want you to keep your place in Malachi 3. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. I'm curious what will be the next level for me. When I get to that level and I look back and I say, you know what, everything I've done up till now has been easy. This, what I'm going through right now, is hard. I'm not looking forward to it, but I know the levels. If my life is showing me a pattern, I know that the, it's coming. All right? It's coming. All sorts of, all sorts of things happen in life, and, and we know things are eventually going to happen. I have both of my parents still with me, living in my hometown. One day they're going to pass away. And I have to be prepared for that. I can't imagine life without them right now. But one day they're not going to be around. I know uh, a few years ago, Miss Fannin lost her father. Um, and, and he's on the other side of the country. And, and that was, you know, it was a tragic time. And, uh, you know, just sad things happen. And we know these things are coming, right? It's, it's coming. Uh, if we live long enough, we're going to experience and we're going to see a lot of tragedies. Our life is going to have sorrow. And, you know, one day my daughters are going to grow up and get married. And, you know, they might, they might get married and move off. And they better stay within driving distance is all I got to say. You listening, girls? Um, you listening, boys? Uh, better stay within driving distance is all I got to say. Um, I would not want my son to grow up and, and join the Army like me after what I've seen it become over the last 21 years. Um, but what if they reinstate the draft and you don't have a choice in the matter? Let's go fight in the jungles in Southwest, Southeast Asia. You know, those are things that we don't know if they could happen or not, but there are things we have to be prepared for. Um, what if something were to happen to my wife like Miss Cheryl Andrews? What if I had to step into that role that Chris Andrews currently finds himself in? What if it happened to me? And she had to start providing for the family. That would be super hard on her, you know. Um, so there's a lot of what ifs. What if something were to happen to one of my kids? That's probably one of the scariest things to ever contemplate. But what if? You're in Matthew chapter 7. I want you to look at verse 24. Jesus is talking and he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and the beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So what if, what if, what if that happened? What if this happens? What if all these things happen? I want you to notice something in Matthew 24. The rain came. The flood waters they rose. The wind, it, it blew, and it beat upon that house. It's going to happen, guys. We're going to have rainy days and floodwaters and high, strong winds. But take comfort in the fact that we're built upon a rock. And whatever comes at us, we always know God is in our corner. We are always going to be okay. All right? And, and if we even find ourselves in a Job situation, the, the whole book of Job was written for us to strengthen us. We know that, you know, Blessed be the name of the Lord at the end of the day, no matter what. Uh, Jesus said in John 16, 33, if the world, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So I can't tell you what's going to happen in my life. Lord willing, I will die of a good old age, but I know for a certainty that if I live long enough, 
I will see these sorrows and tragedies, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. All right, so what does any of this have to do with money? Well, it's simple. Life is hard enough without money problems. Life is hard enough without money problems, and that's the title of my sermon. And our life is full of vanity and vexation of spirit, and we don't have to add sorrows to it by getting into money problems. Most, I would say, probably more than 95% of everybody that has money problems willingly signed up for them, walked right into it. Um, I know a lot of people in the military who struggle with money problems, and they have a great, great job with free health care, good benefits, a good steady paycheck that's always hitting the bank on the first of the month, and they struggle with, mil uh, with money problems. Uh, you know, I understand sometimes you can get sick, you can, you can get into a car accident, you can be the target of a lawsuit, and you can be someone who's been great with money your whole life and you get addicted to alcohol or pain, uh, pain pills and you, you get strung out chasing that high and you spend all your sustenance chasing that demon. That's not God's will for you. And things do happen, uh, but most of the time, most of the time, people sign up for their own money problems. And it doesn't have to be that way. Who's seen that meme where there's like somebody in the, uh, in the lake and they're like, all you see is the top of their head and they're just in the water and they're like, help, help, I can't pay my bills or whatever. And it's just, a, they're, they're drowning in debt. And then the next picture, you see that they're actually sitting in a kiddie pool and they got their, their knees up to their, they're sitting cross-legged Indian style and the water's filled up, but they're just stay, sitting in it. And it shows all these little arrows off to the side. It shows tattoos. It shows $5 Starbucks drinks. It shows, you know, all these movie tickets and date nights and all these things that, and that they signed up for, their cigarettes and their lotto tickets and all this stuff. They, they're doing it to themselves, right? But they're saying, help, I'm, I'm in need of help, you know, but it's a, total, it's a total situation that they got themselves stuck into. All right, uh, here's a fun fact. Uh, Heather almost didn't even consider dating me when, uh, when she found out I was in the military. She assumed that I was a tattooed, foul mouth chain smoking, drinking, partying, fornicating, loser, soldier, which is really this, the, the real stereotype. That's a real thing. Um, she had good reason to think that about me. Uh, and, and seeing the, the, the state of the military decline over the last 21 years, uh, I can tell you that being in the military truly, truly vexes the soul of a Christian person. Uh, I would not uh, advise any young men in here to sign up willingly for that. Um, and, you know, I, as, a, as a recruiter, you're probably saying, well, Jake, how in, how in your right mind could you bring people into this? Uh, you know, I had a crisis of conscience, I guess you could say. I, I had to step away from that. Um, and that's what I did. I stepped away from that for over a year now or 18 months. And, uh, and then, you know, the whole COVID jab thing, that's just the straw that broke the camel's back. I, I got to get rid of it. So I'm, I'm walking away and I'm done with that. As our country gets further away from, uh, from the Constitution, I took an oath 21 years ago today that says, you know, I, I, I swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America and defend it from all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to bear true allegiance to the same that's the oath that I swore to do, and that's not what we as a nation are doing anymore. We're getting farther and farther away from our Constitution. Anyway, so that's just another rabbit trail. Um, but most people who have money problems, they have willingly signed up for them, and life is hard enough without money problems. So I got some statistics here from uh, Ramsey Solutions. That's Dave Ramsey's organization. And he says uh, they found out that money arguments are the second leading cause of divorce, right behind adultery. High levels of debt and poor communication lead to stress and anxiety when it comes to finances. 
nearly half of couples with $50,000 or more in non-mortgage related debt say money is their top reason for arguing. Nearly two-thirds of all marriages start in debt. And lastly, one-third of people who argue with their spouse about money admit to hiding purchases because they know their spouse will not approve. So I want to give you a, a little glimpse into my childhood and my upbringing. Um, I would say I come from a middle-class family. Uh, we didn't live on a farm. I wish we did. That would have been cool to have that early on experience because I'm trying to figure it out and it is hard work, y'all. Um, but I just lived on a, a regular street um, with ranch style houses on both sides of the road all around my neighborhood and uh, just a regular working class, middle class family is where I come from. My mom and my dad, they both worked, my, me and my brother. Uh, we both went to the public schools, rode the school buses. And my mom was a receptionist at a dentist office. My dad, he worked a lot of various jobs and he was a good worker, but you know, they would downsize and have to cut him and he'd have to go find another place and start over. And uh, you know, uh, things were kind of, as far as the family finances go, it was kind of on a wavelength, but highs and lows. But then he got hired on at the prison and he found some stability there and had some good state benefits. But for the most of our life, you know, um, my, my, my family that I grew up in, my parents still live in the same house to this day, same neighborhood, same, same house, and I kind of like that. I like knowing that they're, they're right where I've, uh, I've, I've always known them. But uh, anyways, I'll tell you this. My parents, they didn't fight often, not, not compared to some of the other parents and, and, and the people that have it real bad. But their arguments, their fights, they were always about money. They were always about money, and probably three to four or five times a year, they'd get into some money arguments. And it, it would last for hours, sometimes days. And, they, you know, it starts off over this money situation, and then it, it turns into, well, you remember what you said? You know, and then it all, they, they start bringing up the past, and like, I thought they were arguing about this, and I just walked back into the room, and now they're talking about this, and screaming and shouting, breaking coffee mugs, and all kind of stuff. And it was, it, I hated it. I couldn't stand that environment whenever they would get into those, those situations. So it was impressed upon me as a very uh, young child not to ever let myself get into that situation. If I can help it, I don't want to be screaming and yelling and having fights with my wife over something as stupid as money. So, you know, their, their relationship is much better. They're still married, and, and uh, obviously they, they don't have the pressures of taking care of me and my brother anymore. It's just them two, so they've been able to get their house paid off and get out of a lot of their debts, and I, I think they're doing much better now, and I don't blame them for, you know, what happened. Um, the pressures of life are challenging for anybody, but uh, it definitely impressed upon me, hey, don't, don't find yourself in this situation. If you can help it, work hard to get above it and get ahead of it, and don't ever fall back into this spot. So growing up, I was a, a saver. I, I would get, you know, some money from a birthday or, or, a, or a Christmas, and I'd, I'd have a pocket full of change and some dollar bills, and we'd go into a, a store to go uh, buy some toys or candy or something, and I'd look around, and my son, he's the same way. He, he's, he, uh, we took him on vacation, and before we left, his grandparents gave him some money. And we kept going in all these little shops and, James, you want to spend your money? You want to buy anything? And he's like, no. <laughs> and, and I was the same way. I would walk into a store. I'd look around. I think I feel better with the cash in my pocket. And I would walk right back out, you know. And I, and I would keep it in my sock drawer. And, and I, I would always get it out. You, you judge me if you want. But I'd lay it all out on my floor. And I'd count it all up, have all my quarters and stacks and I'd count up all my money, and I was diligent to know the state of my flocks, all right? So, <laughs> but anyways, I was always a saver as a kid, and um, when I turned 15, going on 16, my best friend who lived three doors down, he, uh, he had a job working at KFC, 
and he was nine months older than me, so they allowed him to work nine months before I could. And I remember when it was getting close to me turning 16, I can finally go get a real job, you know, get away from raking these yards and, and washing these cars down the road. I can start making some real money. He told me, he said, I've got $600 in my bank account. I said, wow, that is incredible, 600 bucks. And uh, so when I turned 16, the new Zaxby's in Waycross just opened. I was there on opening night and he, he, he turned coat. He switched from KFC to Zaxby's. So we both got to go work at the same. I was going to work wherever he was because he had the car. And he was my ride wherever we were going to go. And he, felt, he thought the same way about making money. He, I was going to just be riding off with him. I said, whatever days you're working, I'm working. And, uh, and he was all about it. He worked, I think, six or seven days a week sometimes. But anyways, um, I turned 16. And, and Zaxby, I know that the minimum wage at the time was $5.15, and that's what KFC was paying. Zaxby's was paying $5.25. What? You got to go where the money's at, right? You got you to gotta go where the money's at. So I could only work about three to four days a week. Uh, that's all my parents would allow me to do because I had other responsibilities and school and uh, I shot on the rifle team and all that stuff. But I was making about $125 a week before taxes and after the end of my first year, I had saved up $4,000 and I thought that was pretty cool as a 16 year old. And, um, and so I, I ended up uh, purchasing a Jeep Wrangler, it was used, and I put a down payment on it. My dad co-signed, and they gave me a three-year loan, and I paid it off in less than one year. And I put all my extra money towards it, and I got it paid off. I did not like the idea of having a, a bank note or any kind of debt. And so in my senior year of high school, I was 17 years old. I joined the Army National Guard on March 15, 2002, and I graduated, and I went to basic training in AIT. And when I came home, I had, you can't spend your money while you're there. They give you all your food, all your clothes, all your shelter. You got nothing to spend your money on there. I had $8,000 in my bank account. And then I got home and they gave me my bonus, my sign-on bonus that was going to be paid to me after I completed my training. That was an additional 6000 bucks after taxes. And somewhere between my Zaxby's earnings and my Army earnings, I had about fifteen grand, fifteen thousand dollars in the bank, and I was an eighteen-year-old. And I thought to myself, "Wow, this is cool." And so, keep in mind, during all of this, I was a Pentecostal going to a crazy Pentecostal church, not saved, and and they teach bad doctrine there to this day that you can lose your salvation that nobody takes a bible to church they always look at the powerpoint screens with all their cherry picked verses from all their cherry picked bibles including the message bible they they predict that they can predict the future and they hear from god all the time and you're not really saved unless you can speak in tongues and they got all this bad doctrine but there's one thing that they did teach me that i started back then and I do it to this day, it's tithing. It's tithing. Tithing and paying offerings unto the Lord, uh, giving offerings to the Lord. Um, you know, I, I think mainly, because they harped on it all the time. Uh -oh. They harped on it all the time. Uh, I think the, the pastor was just covetous towards everybody's money. But, um, you know, Second Peter 2, 3 says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not you can lose your place in matthew 7 by the way and go back to malachi 3. but he always had this saying he said you can't outgive god you can't outgive god and uh, they taught the prosperity gospel there they said it is god's will for his kids to prosper in health and wealth and everything you want in life if you just pay you know your tithe and give your offerings God is going to make sure that you get everything that you want in life and if you do all this and that and this and that um, they had us every time we took the offering up in the church they had us always stand up and we had to say this 
mantra. They would put it up on the uh, screens, and it was like, I am a child of God, and God's good will is to bless me, and, and my expenses are going to decrease, and my, my uh, income is going to increase, and blessing and increase, and expenses decrease, and all these things, and it was a cute little saying. Whatever. Prosperity gospel, okay? That's what they're all about there. But I, I was faithful to, to tithe, and watching my parents tithe made me a tither at an early age, and it's something I still do to this day. So, so what's so good about tithing? What's so good about that? Well, for one thing, it's God's money. But I can tell you from my own personal experience, an anecdotal story is I have never come close to being in a financial tight. Never, ever. My wife and I, you know how many money arguments we've ever had? Never. And because money is the number one, well, the number one thing people actually argue about is money, we hardly ever have any fights in the first place. I'm not sitting here bragging, and I know everybody in here has got great marriages, but we have not had money problems. We have not had fights. We, you know, I can count on one hand how many times we actually got a little snarky with each other. And I say that in a cute way. Because if you were to compare our snarkiness to how my parents used to carry on and fight and for days at a time, you would say, that's, that's cute, Jake. Whatever, you know, that's nothing compared to what we've seen and what I've done. Um, but anyways, so we, we don't have these money problems. Um, never even had close to money problems. And I have to say that's because we've always prioritized our finances with God. Now, I'm not saying that's how it's always going to be in the future, but in, since I've been married in the last 16 years, that's how it's always been. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I believe that God gave me a good woman, you know, a good wife. Uh, what is it? It's, uh, I got it right here. Proverbs 19, 14, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Uh, Heather and I were, were both... The oldest ch children in our family, I only had one little brother. She only had one little brother. I think there is something to do with birth order. You know, we, we're both kind of like the responsible ones, and we, we both kind of think the same way, and our, she, her priorities are to take care of the family. My priorities are to take care of the family. You know, that's, we're just, we're a good match for each other. But even if she was the, the seventh child, I think we would have still had a, well, I think we still have a pretty good marriage just because I think the Lord has blessed us. When we got married the night before our wedding, my grandfather said, Jake, here's some advice. Put God first, your wife second, and everybody else comes after that. And I was, I've always done that. And our marriage has always been solid. And uh, we've, we've, we've been very good uh, for each other and to each other. So anyways, I, I'm very blessed. And I, I want to say that's, from the Lord. God gave me a good wife and he blessed us uh, financially because we've always tried to keep him first. That's just anecdotal evidence, guys. That's just one personal testimony that because of our faithful tithing and, and trying to help others and be generous with our money, God has always blessed us. And so if you don't want to take my word for it, that's totally fine. But if you believe the Bible, look at Malachi chapter 3, all right? Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruits before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. All right. So, if you don't want to believe my story, believe the Lord. He says right there, plain and simple, put him as a priority and he's going to take care of you. But now you're going to say, but Jake, you just contradicted yourself. 
you just got through telling us that your parents always fought over money problems, but you said that you learned how to tithe in your old crazy church watching your parents tithe. If it works for you, great. Why didn't it work for them? They didn't have money problems. They had a covetous problem. They wanted to maintain a certain standard of living. They never came close to bankruptcy, never came close to foreclosure, never had any problems. We didn't miss a meal. All of our bills were paid. God did what he said he was going to do. But they fought over covetous and greed and a standard of living and things that and the, they, they weren't on the same wavelength of how to spend their money. So it's important to put a plan together with your spouse and say, hey, this is the goal we want to work towards. Let's work towards that. No, that's not a good idea. Let's actually work towards that. And, and if you put those plans together and you, just, you agree on them and you start working towards them, when you get that money saved up in the bank, now you don't have to fuss and fight over where that money's going to go. It's already been earmarked. You got it already figured out, right? So they didn't have money problems. Uh, it was just they had different ideas of where to spend it. And that's what caused the, the fights and the issues. Uh, I want you to know something that just because you tithe and you give offerings unto the Lord does not mean you're not going to get everything you want and desire in this life. It's not going to happen. But God will take care of you and he will make sure you get what you need. Uh, turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So the critics, the critics will say, well, that's, that's just Old Testament stuff, Jake. God commanded the children of Israel to tithe, but he never told the New Testament church to tithe. And they point you to this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. I, I read this on Facebook two days ago. Somebody was saying this. Somebody that y'all know. I won't tell you who it was. But uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now here's the part, here's the rub. This is where they say, you don't have to tithe. Every man... According as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. They say, see, Jake, you don't have to tithe if you don't want to. You decide how much you want to give in your heart. God loves a cheerful giver. If it's 1%, if it's half of a 1%, give whatever you want. I want you all to know something. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he's saying, hey, these saints back in Jerusalem, these guys have been praying for y'all. They have been supporting y'all. They've been sending people like me to y'all. And I think it's good if we send a little bit back to them. So here's the deal. When I come, I want y'all to lay aside some money and we're going to ship it back to them. I want y'all to know that he's not coming to collect their tithes. He's coming to collect a free will offering from the church of Corinth to send back to Jerusalem. This weekend, on Sunday morning, I will not be here. I will come in that evening, Lord willing. And uh, I'm going to be preaching in uh, Darien, Georgia for the Gideons. I'm going to be representing them. And, and thank God, the, the pastor, I, I, I told him, I said, Hey guys, don't send me to a church that's only going to give me five minutes to plug the Gideons. Give me some meat on the bone. And so I've got a minimum of 30 minutes to speak. And the pastor told me yesterday, he said, really, you can talk as long as you want, but people are going to get up and leave at 11 o'clock. So, okay. Um, so I'm going to get up there and I'm going to plug the Gideons and I'm going to ask them if they want to support the Gideons in purchasing some Bibles, but I'm going to really give them the gospel. That's going to be after that five minute plug, we're going to go straight into the gospel and it's a non-denomination church. So that's going to be a good one. I hope it is. They, they meet in a strip mall too. 
So uh, he said that they started off with 1,400 square feet and now they got 4,000 square feet. And I said, hey, that's cool. Ran a strip mall at my church too. I like how you can, you know, kind of open up the square footage or, or close it off as needed, whatever you got to do. So I'm looking forward to that. But I want you to know, I'm not showing up at, at, uh, on Sunday and saying, hey, all the tithes that come in today, they belong to the Gideons. Give them to me. That's not what Paul did in Corinth either. He's saying, hey, give your church tithes and then lay aside an, a free will offering that you want to give back to Jerusalem. That's exactly what this is. So anybody that says, hey, you don't have to tithe anymore. God, uh, God did away, Jesus Christ did away with that in the New Testament. Now that you're robbing God. And, and that's how he feels about it in Malachi chapter 3. And I cannot afford not to tithe. I, if, if, if things ever get real tight in my budget, I'm going to cut out vacations. I'm going to cut out out to eat. Uh, if things get even tighter than that, I'm going to downsize my living arrangements. I'm going to downsize everything, but tithing's still coming right off the top. I can't afford not to, guys. And, and it's like Gideon. God shaved down his army. She just kept shaving it down. You know Gideon would have lost that battle if he went in there with that entire army? And if he only allowed God to shave down that one, and he's like, no, 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 I, I'm okay with the first cut, God, but we're not doing that anymore. We're going to fight. He would have lost that battle too. It wasn't until after God took away all that he had, and he says, now you're going to do this by faith. God, that God delivered the victory. Gideon was victorious because of that. Well, what if instead of, you know, what if the Bible was uh, more strenuous? What if it said, okay, Children of Israel, Old Testament, 10%. The new Christian church, 50%. You know, we'd be more prosperous than we are today. I believe that. If, if God says, you're going to live on 50% and give me 50%, you're going to be walking on faith. I mean, that's, and I, I know you would be more prosperous. I'm not telling you to give 50%. I'm just saying if that was the standard, God would honor it. Because that would take a lot. So that's just the thought that came to my mind. Um, so you're in uh, 2 Corinthians 9. Turn to 1 Corinthians 9. And I promise I'm 75% of the way done. <laughs> um, 2 Corinthians 9. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Before the law was even instituted to pay a 10% tithe, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. So if Abraham gave tithes unprovoked, why can't you, oh Christian man? And I know I'm preaching to the, the crowd here. I, I know there ain't nobody I, I don't suspect. But um, how are we supposed to pay the pastor if you don't pay your tithes? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? He's saying, hey, don't we have the power to just walk away from these jobs and focus on the ministry and, and be paid off the ministry? Who goeth to warfare at any time at his own of charges? Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing that we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do not ye know that they which minister about holy things live off the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live off the God, should live of the gospel. So, if a minister of Christ is preaching the gospel and they're expected to live off the gospel, where do we expect this money to come from? From the local church. We can't just say, hey, we got to pay our pastor. Maybe the church downtown will pay him. 
And God's not going to just throw money down from heaven either. So uh, we're not going to expect unbelievers. We're not going to expect the government to, pit, to step in and pay our pastors. So where's the money going to come from? God's saying in the New Testament that these pastors, these preachers are worthy of double honor and that they should be paid and live off the gospel. Christ says in the sermons of the, uh, um, and, and this is all just to prove the point that tithing is not going away with. Offerings and giving has not gone away with. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, remembering when he says, When thou doest alms, when ye pray, when ye fast, he expects you to pray, he expects you to fast, he expects you to give. All right? That has not been done away with. So, what should the tithes and the offerings that a local church collects be used for? What should we use all the funds that come in? Um, well, for one, we've already established that the pastor should be paid and should be receiving wages. Number two, the ministration of the church, the cost of providing a suitable space for us to all assembly and worship, uh, the cost of providing sustenance and aid to the impoverished in the church, like the Acts chapter 6 widows who were being uh, ministered to and they were given of the daily ministration. And, and, and Malachi chapter 3 says that there shall be meat in mine house. God wants us to have his house furnished and have things provided for for his children inside of the house our government should have no role in doing what the church is the church's responsibility is we would not have broken families if the government had never stepped into the church's role never would have happened a woman would not just walk away from her family if if her husband and her church were looking after her you know never going to happen so our government should not be meddling in the church's business. Um, and then what else should we use the funds for? If we, you know, we're taking care of the pastor and we, we're, we're trying to take care of the lights and, and keep the building up and, and, and keep our, our, our shelves stocked in here and with everything that goes on with running a church, what else should we be doing with our tithes and offering? I would say anything the congregation approves of that honors God. Like the Maffel twins came to visit last year and we blessed them with a blessing. That's great. Um, whenever we decide to do certain things with the funds, like uh, the idea of purchasing hymnals, great. We, we should have a lot of things earmarked and say this takes priority and then this and then this and then this. Sounds like we need to have a business meeting. Oh, we are at the end of the month. We're going to talk about where should we be spending our money. So I think we're doing a great job with all that. Now, this next part, I cannot back up with Scripture. I speak as a man, all right? I'm just going to say what I think. But if you ever find yourself in another church just visiting, like just this past week, I was at Revival. I saw some grants down there, too. Uh, we were in uh, Revival. Uh, but if you ever just find yourself on a Wednesday night or a, or a Sunday, I'm going to be uh, at this Darien church on Sunday morning. Uh, this is just my opinion but I believe that your tithe, which is God's tithes, belong to your local church. So, you know, if you, if you would like to give to that particular church that you're visiting, by all means. Um, and, and I do practice that. But when I get back to my home church, I give to my home church the tithes. And that's, that's how I practice it. Um, why is that? And I say that only because your local church especially a small church, comes to depend on those funds. You know, and, and some people, it, it, don't, it don't matter if you pay your tithes every service, every week, or once a month. But if, if you pay your tithes on the first of the month when you get paid and you write a big fat check, that's excellent. But if you find yourself in a different church at that first service on a different month and you write your big fat check to that church... Our church might suffer because of that. You know, like we, we come to depend on those funds to keep the lights on and keep everything. We got our bills. A church budget is just like a family budget. And we really need to keep uh, everything in sync. Anyways, that's just my opinion. Uh, take it for what it's worth. And I'm wrapping this up. But what happens? What happens if your tithes and your offerings go to a church and you find out the pastor has been using it for gambling and drugs and prostitution. What happens then? Does that ever happen, by the way? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, it does sometimes. What happens? Nothing happens. You know, God sees your heart. And you don't tithe because God needs your money. You tithe because you're being faithful to the Lord. And just because some other man wasn't faithful with the Lord's tithes doesn't change your relationship with God in the, in the least bit way. It's not about the deacon, you know, with the sticky fingers. I'm looking at you, Brother Ross. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not about Judas who controls the bag, you know. It's, it's about your heart. And he cares about your heart and, and how you feel about him. And, and he wants you to trust him with his money because it is his money. So um, turn to Psalm 37. Remember, we read in Malachi 3, it says, Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. <clears throat> I believe that worrying about money is a sin. I believe that worrying about anything in life is a sin. When you're worrying, you are casting doubt that God is not going to help you out. You're casting doubt that God is not going to come through for you to see you through whatever trial you find yourself in. So I've already talked to you about the story of Gideon. And uh, I believe that God is more than capable of doing with 90% than what you can do on your own with 100%. All right, so you're in Psalm 37. Look at verse 3. Trust in the Lord. When you tithe, you're putting your trust in the God. When you're giving offerings above your tithe, you're trusting in God. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So God wants to know, do you trust him enough to give him your tithe and your offerings and just see what he's going to do for you? God knows your heart. He gives more grace. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. I think that might be the last place we're going to go. Yeah, yeah. Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, so anyways, here is some quick down and dirty, fast and loose tips to avoid money problems. Because that's the whole sermon, right? Life is hard enough without money problems. So let's get to some practical tips. How to avoid some money problems. Stay out of debt as humanly possible. You have to sign up for it, so don't sign up for it. All right? Now, I understand there are certain things like mortgages that you just got to have sometimes. Sure, but be smart about it. Um, save up a good down payment if you can. Um, especially don't co-sign a loan for a friend. You're in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger... Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the of the fowler. Don't go into debt if you can help it and don't co-sign for a friend. That's just dumb. All right, don't do it. But if you do do it, you better burn the midnight oil and dig yourself out of that hole you just got yourself in, all right? Don't spend all your margin. Who, who's heard of the joke, I used to live paycheck to paycheck, but now through hard work and growing, I now live direct deposit to direct deposit. Have y'all heard that? <laughs> Don't live paycheck. Don't spend all, all your money every time you get paid. Uh, instead of financing that car you've had your eyes on that you know you can't afford, set your sights on something a little older, a little more used, and, and save up more money and just buy it outright if possible. 
or if you get or get a, a very solid um, solid down payment for it. Um, get into the habit of, of taking a portion of your paycheck and setting aside your tithe, your offerings, set aside a portion for your savings, set aside a portion for improving your financial situation. You might say, oh, are you talking about investing? There's nothing wrong with investing, but I'm talking about improving your financial situation. If you're in this much debt, how about you knock it down here? Paying down debt is improving your financial situation. All right? So, um, you're, if you don't improve your financial situation, you're never going to get where you want to get. Never going to happen. All right? Um, track your spending habits, a.k.a. set up a budget. Look at your bank account, see where your money's going each month. And, and maybe you need to do this. Maybe you said, okay, I'm going to look at, we're, we're getting close to the end of March. So you go and you, I'm going to pull my bank records for January, February, and March. I'm going to see how the first quarter of 23 is looking out. How much money have I spent on restaurants and out to eat? And you track and you say, January, I spent $384. And February, I spent $298. And in March, I spent $428. You, try, you add them all up and you divide them by three and you say, on average, I am spending $319 a month on out to eat. That's almost a whole grocery budget right there, you know. And then you can say, if I just stop going out to eat, we can eat, like, we can eat a whole lot more at the house. And, and we can stretch this out further. So, you know, you won't know that unless you actually sit down and do the homework, figure out where your money's going. Maybe you're spending too much on the Starbucks. Maybe you're spending too much on, on needless subscriptions that you signed up for four years ago that you've forgotten about and it's still popping your account every month, you know? I don't have to tell anybody in here how to lose weight. I'm a little bit on the chubby side, I know, but I, I, I know how to lose weight. That everybody does, right? Eat less, eat better, exercise more. Money is the same way. Spend less, make more. You know, it's the same way. I, well, I don't have to really grind this into your mind. We all know it already. It's good to hear it sometimes. It's easy, in theory, to save money, improve your financial situation, give to the Lord. That's a no-brainer. Um, but sometimes thinking is easy and doing is hard. And actually, I had, I'm talking about weight, but just the other day, I was in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> And I had a fortune cookie. And the fortune cookie said, to think is easy. To act is difficult. To act as one thinks is the most difficult of all. I thought that's pretty profound. And I was like, oh man, am I really going to use a Chinese fortune cookie in my sermon tonight? <laughs> it's okay, I'm going to wash it down with three, sermon, or th three, three Bible verses right now. All right? Proverbs 23, uh, Proverbs 27, verse 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. Ecclesiastes 11, verses 1 and 2. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, and also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Don't put all your money in Bitcoin. Don't put it all in bonds. Don't put it all in the stock market. Don't put it all in stamps. Spread it out. Matthew 5, verse 41 and 42. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Who knows if God has sent that person to you to test you? He's like, oh, hey, Jake's having a hard time financially. I know he's not wanting to come off any money right now, but I'm going to send his old long-lost friend that ain't caught him in five years to go knock on his door or give him a call, and he's going to hit him up for money. Let's see how he does. God might just be testing you with those situations that pop up in life. And uh, one last thing, there's nothing new under the sun. I got an article in preparation of tonight's sermon. I printed it off. And you won't believe this. This was printed March the 7th, 2023. Eight days ago. 
listen, now this is profound, this is mind-boggling, this is going to blow you away. Buy now, pay later borrowers struggle more financially, study finds. I've never heard of that before. You mean payday loan people have a hard time financially? When did that? We found that out in March 2023. All right, great. Hey, guys, stay away from payday loan centers, all right? Anyway, there's nothing new under the sun. You know how to save. You know how to invest. You know how to pay down debt. Uh, you, you, you should be tithing, and, and that will avoid your money problems. If you still have money problems, you got a spending problem, okay? Um, God bless you all. Let's pray. I've gone a little long, all right? Dear Lord, we thank you for this um, opportunity to, to get to preach the word tonight. I, I ask that you, you help this sermon to seep down into the ears of everyone that heard it. And Lord, allow us to apply these principles. And Lord, we should always honor you with our first income and our tithe and our offerings. And God, we know that you're faithful. We know that you can do more with our 90% than we can do with our 100%. And we just ask for your blessings as we try to be faithful stewards over everything that already belongs to you that you're entrusting with, uh, with us as our time on this earth is fleeting. And we love you, God. We ask that you give us safe travels back home tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.